Tere hommikust! Lähme esimese kutsutud ettekande juurde ja kuna see on inglis keeles, siis ma nüüd ka vahetan keelt vabandust. Let's move on to the first invited talk. It's from Simon Krek from Slovenia, from the Josef Stefan Institute, who is doing something very similar to what we are doing here in the Institute for Estonian Language uh, regarding dictionaries. And uh, we have had a long and uh, interesting cooperation, uh, the latest example of which was uh, yesterday afternoon. We, we had some discussion on uh, data models and stuff. Uh, and uh, it's always a, a pleasure to uh, discuss with somebody with whom uh, on both sides, there are strong opinions weekly held, so that uh, we can uh, move on to something together, move on to something that uh, we can develop. Uh, sometimes we are a bit ahead, sometimes the Slovenians are a bit ahead, and then we discover that uh, one of us is mistaken, and, and then we discover new stuff. And uh, now uh, Simon's talk is... Uh, almost exactly about uh, the topics that uh, we have been uh, cooperating on. So I'm very much looking forward to the talk. And uh, Simon, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, <coughs> everything Otharvi said is true, completely true. And I'm really happy to be here uh, because we had plans uh, for last year and I couldn't come. So uh, this year, <coughs> uh, I'm here and I'll start immediately because I, I have quite a lot of slides, which is my uh, habit. Um, okay, so the, um, the talk is about the database, the digital dictionary database that we are creating for some time now. But in particular, um <coughs> I would like to talk about uh, general approach to organization of dictionary data. That's why I put this um, <coughs> subtitle there. Uh, just to see what we'll talk about, I'll have a slide about myself so that you see the position I'm talking from. Uh, then uh, a reminder about what unstructured, semi-structured and st structured data is. Some history when we started doing what we do. And then the core of my talk will be about the dictionary <coughs> database. <coughs> and then I'll finish with <coughs> where we are in Slovenia, basically, and what we will do next. <coughs> so uh, just to understand, I'm in this business, let's say, for 30 years, almost 30 years. I started as a dictionary editor. And this is the, it was in the book area. So my first dictionary, which I worked on for 10 years, was English-Slovenian dictionary, a really big one. And we created also the first Slovenian corpus inside that project. Then I kind of moved to language technology, basically for Slovene. And for the last 10 years, it's in, uh, <coughs> let's say, European context, uh, where we were working together, also with the Institute of Estonia, in this cost action. and organizing ELEX conferences and so on. And the last one was the big <coughs> European project called European Lexicographic Infrastructure or ELEXIS. Uh, so, <coughs> unstructured data. <coughs> I took uh, the definitions basically from Wikipedia just to remind us what we're talking about. So it's basically strings of characters. You have text, <coughs> you, don't know m you don't know much about uh, what's in there. And usually in the context of lexicography, we talk about corpora, evidence or text, something that we work with uh, <coughs> as strings of text. Semi-structured data <coughs> is what we know uh, as dictionaries, let's say, in XML structure. So we have some structure, we have some hier hierarchy, and 
still most of existing dictionaries are uh, in that kind of form. We can find them. Uh, it can be LMF, it can be TEI, it can be various uh, standards that are around for uh, text. But basically it's XML and basically it's what we would say it's semi-structured data. And this is what we will talk about today. Uh, so um, there is no direct definition of structured data in Wikipedia. So I just asked ChatGPT how to define it, and it provided uh, well kind of a good description, let's say. It's a bit, you know, like ChatGPT is a bit chatty, so I had to cut it down because <laughs> it was longer. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, there are three uh, important things in the definition. First, that structured data is more for machines than for humans. And it has quite important implications for what we will talk about today. Then uh, it's organized in a database, which typically has a data model, and it's a lot, a lot of relations between little slots in tables, rows, and uh, columns. And I think that this is what will basically happen, and this is what we are doing in Slovenia, and you are doing here in Estonia. So we have to put a lot of lexicographic type of data into tables, rows, columns, and so on. So how do we do it, and what are the problems? In my opinion, these are the problems. So uh, <coughs> you have nice little running text, so it's typical, classical text. Uh, how do you put it in tables? You know, how do you do it? You dissect it like a, like a corpse, let's say. So you have a living thing, which you can read and so on, and then you put it in some really artificial kind of structure. Uh, <clears throat> the second important question is, uh, <clears throat> So if you have, well, in, in my experience, first thing in NLP what happened is that uh, I <clears throat> was faced with concepts like bag of words, you know. So you just have something that is between spaces and this is what you work with on a massive scale. But language is not like that. Language is basically you know, sequences which have different kind of uh, life in the text. And lexicography is about explaining either what a word means or a, let's say, longer sequence means. And this is quite a, this is quite a challenge when you, put, um, when you put that kind of sequences into this artificial kind of environment, which is databases. So this, I'll talk about this quite a lot <coughs> later. And then there is the question of grammar. Uh, in dictionaries and in corpora, how, where do you put grammar? Where do you put morphology or syntax? How do you do it in the tables? Do you attach it to something? What do you attach it to? And so on. Uh, then. Uh, there, there's a question of how many databases? Just one? You know, it's really complex one, or you make one and then the satellite ones, which you refer to, and so on. That's quite a challenge there. <clears throat> and, well, the last one is for the people who come from the, let's say, previous era. <laughs> like I said in the beginning, uh, from paper dictionaries, uh, whoever made that kind of dictionary knows that it's basically also a narrative. You know, you just, you just, you tell a story about the word, and it's some, in some kind of structure which you can understand, and you try to put it in a way that also other people will understand. And 
databases basically destroy that kind of thinking. So you have to reorganize uh, the dissected kind of information and reform it in a way that it would be understandable. So um, <clears throat> this is what we'll talk about too. So how did we start? This is a bit of history. <clears throat> Ten years ago, we started with a project which uh, had, uh, well, it was more than 10 years ago, but 10 years ago we ended up with this structure, let's say, where we said, OK, we will organize our stuff, our uh, data in a way that it would be good for the machines and for humans. And it was still, so the end of this was still semi structured data. It was not a database, it was basically XML. But it was organized in this way that it would have strictly defined layers where we say, OK, at the, <coughs> uh, at the top, we just say something about lemmas headwords, nothing about senses or semantics at all. Then you would get to a sense layer, then you would proceed to syntax layer. Under that, you would have actually concrete pieces of text, which would be collocations and examples from the corpora. And you have multi-word units on the level of um, <coughs> sense and phraseology on the level of lemma. So that was the organization we had, and we were quite happy about it at the time. <laughs> and uh, what we wanted to do is, you know, just to automate uh, to automate extraction from corpora as much as we could. And we succeeded to do that basically through um, what was uh, available in the sketch engine. So the sketch engine was our the tool that we used. And quite a lot of stuff we actually could extract automatically. We were happy about it. We could extract good examples with good X, we could extract collocations, a lot of coll millions of collocations through word sketches. We could <coughs> do something about labels, so uh, about um <coughs> where you can find the, uh, the text in what kind of, I mean, the expressions in what kind of text, so we, w we could say that this is more, uh, looks like terminology, this looks like some style labels we could put there, and so on, and so on. Um, <coughs> okay, so that was mm, 10 years ago. We had, basically, the organization was like this. Uh, Lexicon <coughs> was a separate database, if you remember what I said before. So we said morphology, um, pronunciation, all that kind of stuff. It, we, we would have it somewhere else. We would just provide the link to the lexicon. Uh, we would actually add some grammatical information to the lexicon units itself. <coughs> uh, then we would have two types of uh, semantic information. We would have very short semantic indicators and then longish semantic frames, which look like something from FrameNet or corpus pattern analysis or co-build style definitions, let's say. Um, then <coughs> we would have one level down. Uh, we would have information about syntactic structures uh, or patterns and combinations. I will not go deeply into that uh, because I will talk about it a bit later also. Uh, and as I said, this is how uh, our source looked like at the time. It doesn't look like that anymore. Um, and the idea was basically to make the computer do what it can. <coughs> then we would use or put the data to crowdsourcers and uh, then after that, uh, it would be, like, say, classical uh, 
lexicographic work, like all about senses, because you can't do much uh, with crowdsources about semantics. Uh, then there will be some specialists, and in the end, we would have a nice <coughs> entry, which we would actually say this is the finished entry. Everything is fine. Uh <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. So at the end, <coughs> what at that stage, let's say in 2013, 14. Uh, what we were happy about and what we were unhappy about. Uh, we were happy about <coughs> the, the type of organization that we have. So that it starts with something which is kind of abstract and goes down to concrete pieces of text from corpora. We were actually happy about <coughs> the extraction, so we could do quite a lot. You know, if you think about manual work that had to be done before any of that existed, that's a big difference. And also we were happy about crowdsourcing. <coughs> so we could do, uh, actually use crowdsourcing in the way that we intended. What we were not happy about <coughs> is that, you know, as soon as you got something from the corpus, you suddenly forgot about it uh, completely. What do I mean by that? So you extract a collocation, which has something like 20,000 hits in the corpus. We didn't know which sentences those collocations were in. We didn't know from what kind of text they come. Uh, we had no metadata about those sentences and so on. So I call that corpus dementia. So <clears throat> suddenly, you know, you have a nice piece of a nice entry as a starting point, but you don't know nothing about, you know nothing about where it came from. So we were unhappy about that. We were also unhappy about the fact that <clears throat> if we had, uh, you know, a lexicographer created some uh, <clears throat> string of text, which is a syntactic combination, uh, something that is more than collocation and so on. And what we, would ha uh, what we would know about that? It would be, again, just a string of characters with spaces. We know nothing about whether it's a noun, a verb, in what kind of form, uh, so what are the features that are <coughs> of that form and so on. So. <coughs> We were unhappy about that. We were also a bit unhappy about the fact that we have no control on how the extraction is done. So if we had a nice idea, we would need to go to uh, the sketch engine people and they would decide if we would get that or not. So we were unhappy about that. And we were unhappy about dictionary writing systems, which were all basically XML um, editors. And we tried them all. We tried <coughs> so IDMs, ILEX from Denmark, TLEX from South Africa, later Lexonomy. We tried them all. I mean, they are good, but we were still unhappy about them. <laughs> uh, OK, so now we come to <coughs> what's happening now. After that, after this period, let's say, we proposed <coughs> in Slovenia <coughs> a new method how to create a dictionary. And it was basically between, after the period I mentioned, from 2015, this one, the English one, was uh, published in 2018. And it's a lot of text about what I explained <coughs> before. <coughs> but there was a one big change. And this is it. So we, uh, to, to, to kind of alleviate all, all those problems that I mentioned, we thought, and well, I have to add something else. Time 
or the period is actually important because it, <coughs> you know, from 2008 when those previous projects began until 2015, the world kind of changed. We knew that it's what we are doing is much less for human consumption, let's say, and much more for the machines. So we, uh, we thought that it was really important to move to, uh, well, the machine readability of what we do, let's say. And basically that means a database. <coughs> so um, that was the beginning of what I'll show basically today, <coughs> in 2015. And the idea is that, well, you create a really kind of complex data model for your stuff. And we worked on, on it, on the data model for f at least five years or more. Uh, and it was exciting. It was good time, I have to say. Uh, the <coughs> So the last period was inside this project, which was a big Slovenian NLP uh, project between, well, it was basically during COVID uh, and finished in February this year. And this is when we actually published uh, all these things that are here. So we have the data model and the data. We have public API. Uh, we have the database itself on Clarion repository, so anybody can use it either through API or uh, as a database or data, data set, let's say. And this was done, <coughs> as I said, this was published in February. So this is the, basically the, um, the address where you can find all these things that I will talk about now in next few minutes. Uh, <coughs> The information we have is what is the domain, data model links, the overview, the data model itself, and how you can use the API. <coughs> and this is the data model. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, it's nice. So um, the important thing, I'll talk about this part a bit more is what we consider lexical units. So this is the central part. Word forms part is basically everything that was separately organized in, uh, in the lexicon. So it's about morphology, it's about pronunciation, stress, and so on. Then we have the syntactic part. <coughs> so uh, the layer below, if you remember, then we have the, the, the semantic part, let's say. Then there are translations, so the um, link to other languages. And then we have corpora and some general stuff. So resource connections means connections. So when we say resource, it's one look on the database, uh, <coughs> which can mean something like I have only uh, the morphological data I want to look at. And then I have links to other resources, which would be, I don't know, Slovenian Hungarian dictionary or collocations dictionary or whatever. So these are <coughs> the connections between what we call resources, so looks at the database, <coughs> yeah, and some general stuff. And this is the important part, particularly for <laughs> lexicographers, I think, because the most difficult thing uh, is <coughs> if, you, if you think about all the language that, that is there and <coughs> you want to describe certain parts of the language, which can be single words, which can be some kind of expressions of different types. <coughs> so the important thing, the, what lexical unit means here is as a lexicographer, I want to say something about this thing. I want to record it, I want to say something about it. Because not everything, I don't want to say every, <laughs> any, well, something about everything. It's just the things that are 
lexicogra uh, of interest uh, lexicographically. <coughs> so that's a simple one, although you also have emojis and stuff like that. Uh, <coughs> and this is where it gets interesting with multi-word expressions. So the really big difference is between the yellow part and the green part. And the yellow part says this has something, so <coughs> it is interesting in the way that I have to say something about semantics. So I have to describe what it means. And this part says, no, I don't want to say anything about it. I just want to <coughs> record it as a lexical unit. But the semantics is attached to something else. It can be either a word or a compound or whatever. So that's the big difference. And between <coughs> uh, related to that difference, we have two parts where we say, this looks more like something very stable like terminology or something, and this looks like more like phraseology. And <coughs> in this part, it, we would say this is something where we have a fixed syntactic structure where collocations appear, and this is everything else. I have to hurry up. But this one is quite interesting lexicographically because all the language that is lexicographically relevant is in one of those slots. So how do we deal with, <coughs> with uh, <coughs> the strings of text where we don't know anything about it? So this is how it's organized. As soon as you have, as soon as you have um, something that is more than one word, we would actually have that kind of uh, information attached to it. So we would know what its syntactic structure is, <coughs> we would know the lemma, we would know the morphosyntactic des description. So a anything that is here, so in those four, oops, yeah, in those four categories, compound phrase, combination, collocation, basically has that kind of information. That's how you don't forget anything about words anymore in the database. <coughs> and, uh, <coughs> well, this is the syntactic part. When we, talk about, um, when we talk about syntactic kind of information, basically it's dependency trees. It can be our own, which is called DOS, the one that is shown here, or universal dependencies, or anything else. <coughs> <coughs> so this is inside what is ID 1 to 2 in syntactic structures. And the syntactic structure is composed of how many components you have, what are the dependencies, and what are the restrictions, uh, like perhaps uh, some morphological f features and so on. Uh, <coughs> and this is the link now between, uh, well, this is the frame shallow semantics part, let's say, where we have for everything that we extract from the corpus, we also know uh, <coughs> <coughs> what is its uh, syntactic structure. And we, we also have the tree, which means that we, these are researchers, translated researchers, but we also know that the tree says uh, that um, <coughs> it's Scandinavian and American researchers. So we know uh, about the pattern who analyzes what whom, and collocation under that is researchers analyze data. So we don't <coughs> forget about tho that kind of information anymore. And <coughs> this is what we have. So all our, our corpora are now parsed in this way. So uh, we also have dependency syntax, semantic roles, and named entities. So we can attach that kind of information to all the sentences that where we find anything lexicographically interesting with two <coughs> uh, types of dependency trees. 
Um, so, <sighs> what did we do in the meantime? We did something about corpus dementia, we did something about string of characters curse. Uh, so we are happy with that. We created our own system how to extract data <coughs> in the way that we detached ourselves from the sketch engine. Uh, but this is what we don't have and this is what you have <laughs> in Equilix. We are creating now a dictionary writing system which is basically the <coughs> system which operates with that data model uh, and nothing else. So it's not something that would, you would say you would call XML editor. It's actually the database editor. And we will have it, I hope, in October, yeah. <coughs> okay, so we move from the model, the data model, to API. It's available here. It looks like this. This is Swagger. Um, installation uh, and I think this is at least judging from what we discussed yesterday this is kind of important so if you think about it you have a database <coughs> and you want to collect information so you don't want to do everything yourself so who can do something for you which means that you basically allow you allow that some information comes to your database from somewhere else, but you have to control it. So what we do, we have two use cases now. <coughs> One is the terminology portal, which was created also uh, within that project that I mentioned. And we uh, established a connection between the terminology portal and uh, our database in the sense that uh, <coughs> whenever somebody puts some string in the terminology portal, which would be a term, basically, uh, the system goes to our database. It asks, does your <laughs> database have actually information about what, is, uh, what was put in the portal? And if we do have it, um, yeah, so if we do have it, then uh, <coughs> we would return the IDs and information about it. If not, we would actually put the term in the database as a new thing, a new lexical unit, which means that everybody who works in the terminology portal works for us, which is very nice. But the, uh <coughs> the thing is that it has to be controlled in a way. The terminology portal uh, has really kind of strict authentication. So we know for each term who created it so that we get rid of trolls and so on. It's uh, basically at the university and you expect that professors and students, more reliable people work on it. So we will get a lot of terminology in the database automatically in this way, which is good. And uh, the same thing goes with the other system. We have a project, uh, <coughs> well, maybe that's a bit interesting also. So we have a law which says that all universities need to provide lectures in Slovenian, which is kind of problematic if we want to have foreign, well, <laughs> either professors or um, students from, <coughs> from abroad. And one of the things that is possible now is to create a system that <coughs> translates Slovenian lectures in real time. And this is the project called Online Notes. And for that, uh, we also collect um, automatically transcribed lectures. And if a professor uses a term that is not, well, parsable, recognizable, then we put it also in our database. So there is another resource or source of information that we can get from uh, somebody else. And we want to do that more. So whenever we have a reliable source, we will actually uh, set up a system like this. 
Um, <clears throat> okay, so that was about API. And um, now visualization. So <clears throat> if you think about it, you have a database and you can actually uh, either visualize or extract or export or do anything if you have uh, an idea what kind of information you, have, you, you want to get out of the database. So in this particular case, we just want to have synonyms. So it's a relation in the database between lexical units. And we say, OK, we have um, <coughs> senses, we have uh, synonyms, and we want to visualize them in this way which means that we take out from the database the morphology part or part of the morphology part. <coughs> we uh, visualize information about or relations about syn synonymy and antonymy. Uh, we include just part of semantic type of information, which is the indicators. We could also include longer ones. Uh, this is how you can decide then what is useful for you or not. And that's when you get a thing like this. So it's in beta now. Um, and I wanted to stress this part. So it's the crowdsourcing part. We published uh, the first version of the Thesaurus some, um, I don't know, four five years ago, and we got quite a lot of uh, feedback. So people like to write synonyms in the, uh, in the part of the interface where they can do it. Um, and the interesting thing is this, uh, the situation is like in Wikipedia. So you know that Wikipedias are actually made by quite well, not a lot of people. So you have some contributors that work, you know, all night and day. And then you have this long tail of people who just contribute one thing and so on. And this is exactly the situation. So we have this contributor here uh, who really contributed a lot. And what is important that you allow that the name is here. So you can identify who is the contributor, people like that. Uh, and we got a lot of uh, information from here, but this, does not, this is not part of the database itself. So we don't allow uh, uh, in, so differently than in previous case, we don't allow that this goes directly without our intervention. So we just collect it and then we decide what from this part is actually useful or not. Um, yeah, and this is the collocations dictionary, the same thing. Uh, and so this is all the same database. So we have collocations, you have synonyms, you have uh, Slovenian Hungarian dictionary, so bilingual dictionary, which has the same. Um, semantic in indicators, but with also with translations. And yeah, well, I'll explain that part later. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> where are we now and what to do next? So I have three parts about this. One is that um, what we plan to do or what we do with corpora. So we, what we do is we collect corpus data on a daily basis. We add about 150,000 words per day to the corpus, which means that we can also show that kind of data in a thing like this. We call it slidilnik or a follower or something like that. Uh, so you can actually access information about what is going on with language on a monthly basis. 
we want to get to less than that. So we do it on a monthly basis now because we don't have people who deal with that. But we want to do it on a weekly basis or I'm not sure about daily basis, we'll see. <coughs> then what we want to do is to show a summary about a word or an expression from all the corpora that we have. So this is what we are doing now. Corpusnik. Uh, and what we want to move to is the sense level annotation. So we won't do anything much about uh, lower levels of annotation because we are quite happy with, I don't know, almost 98% of accuracy and so on. But what we really want to do is to <coughs> add information about senses. And this is one example of what uh, we did already also within that project. Um, <coughs> So this would be something called uh, word sense induction. So we kind of create clusters based on context, and we can see if these contexts change through time. So in the year 1997, there was this blue part, and it kind of disappeared and is replaced by the red part, which basically means the portal as an architectural feature, and this is the internet portal. So we can also, if we know what is the red part, we also can annotate all the instances where the red part is, and we will know also that it's an internet portal versus this one, and so on. So <coughs> this is what we want to do. Um, So what we want to do about the database and the <coughs> dictionary database and lexicographic data. So one thing that we want to do is SonaWeb for Slovenian. <laughs> so all the data uh, <coughs> that we have in one interface. So this is where we are behind and we are, well, uh, avid followers, let's say. <laughs> uh, this is something I'm quite looking forward to. So in the project that we had, so the last one, it was quite a big project, 4 million euros, and we had 300,000 euros dedicated to the data that would be interesting for any kind of uh, <coughs> natural language processing including uh, semantics. So we bought from the authors uh, the right to use their dictionaries under open access. So we bought off, let's say, about 30 dictionaries, mostly bilingual and encyclopedias and so on, uh, which we will, we are now at this moment in the process of converting to DMLEX, one of the standards that we work on from Elexis project. And when we have this, we will add about 25 languages to the database, which means that we will be able to visualize not just the Hungarian data, but also all other data, including languages like Romani and some more, let's say, exotic ones. And I hope that we will have the uh, previously mentioned uh, <coughs> uh, dictionary writing system or database <laughs> writing system. And this last one is actually the most important one, in my opinion. <coughs> Since last November, everybody was amazed and flabbergasted, whatever you want to call that, what uh, large language models can do. So from, I would say, from January, we are intensively prompting and trying to get to uh, ideal prompts 
that would generate lexicographically relevant stuff like definitions, sense structures, or even entire dictionary entries and so on. <coughs> and just as a piece of PR, we will have a <laughs> round table in Alex conference in Brno in two months exactly about this. So this is, this is where we will explain uh, about the results of this work that we do. Um, and when I was browsing through my slides from 10 years ago, I have to, I have to show this because I still like it. <coughs> so uh, what we were thinking about at that time is can we just make an automatically created dictionary content? That, that is the AC <laughs> ACDC. Automatically created dictionary content. It's not the band. Uh, so <coughs> what we were thinking about is, OK, definitions, combinations like collocations and so on, stuff from corpora. Also, <coughs> we can find um, pronunciations and things. We can get uh, stuff from Twitter, from Facebook. No, not Facebook, but from Twitter for sure. We can visualize things and also translate them. And I also put here uh, natural language generation. So that was 10 years ago. A natural language generation means large language models and so on. So this is what we are talking about, and we were talking about 10 years ago. Um, <coughs> so this is my last slide. I was thinking when I created this um, PowerPoint what to put here, and then I decided I'll just put this picture. Because basically, what will happen, not just lexicography, but a lot of things that are related to, I don't know, language. Uh, it will depend, it will depend on whoever creates these things. And it's not just this one. So everybody is just talking about GPT-3, GPT-4 and so on. There are others. <coughs> So this, this is um, Google, I think. Uh, and the only one, the only European one, uh, so two of them are from Europe, I think. And the important one is this one, Bloom. And why? Because um, you see what's written here, available, which means that we can actually access it and this one is closed. So everything that is closed, you don't know what is in, you don't know how it got in, you, just can, you can just use it. But this one, you can also create. So, <coughs> um, oh yeah, I think this is Google, all of them, all the, <coughs> the blue ones. Bloom is made basically by the French and it's open and it's quite possible that in the next years or even this year a fairly big European consortium which will start working on upgrading this one. So what I think is also from a lexicographic point of view, uh, the important thing is to have access to something like this. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much for the interesting talk. Are there any questions in the audience here? Is there anything on the web? No? Oh, oh the, yes, Margit. Thank you, Simon, for a very interesting talk. I would like to ask about lexicographers. How many lexicogra lexicographers are there for working for you and, uh, and agreeing with all this kind of stuff, getting from 
uh, generators and, and so on. Um, how many lexicographers actually prompt? This is your question. Uh, how many are prompting and uh, how many are, uh, lexicographers are, are there helping you to getting this uh, everything all right? And, uh, and how many lexicographers really understand uh, what, is, what is in the database and how it works? Ah, what is in the database? Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, that's two different questions. Well, we are a very small community, <laughs> right? So, uh, <clears throat> basically, three people are working on prompting. It's me, Istok, and Polona. <laughs> Uh, and how many people we have that work with the database? Uh, about 10, I think, something like that, yeah, all together, that understand what is the data model and so on. About two of them are on the, oh no, three of them are on the NLP side, or let's say computer side, and the rest of them are on the lexicographic or linguistic side. Yeah. Thanks. Um, is this on? Yeah. Um, very interesting overview. One question I have is that you've shown, in a sense, two types of developments. On the one hand, you've gone from unstructured, semi-structured to fully structured databases. And of course, in computational linguistics, we have now different annotation models and things have gotten very sophisticated. But then you mentioned ChatGPT. And in a sense, that seems almost like the inverse. Let's get rid of all structure. Let's do end-to-end -end training. Let's forget about linguistics and let's forget about lexicography. And uh, you know, how do you see the tension between basically ignoring what we scientists know, you know, lexicographers, linguists, um, and being very successful with that, but then how can we bring back this insight that we've developed as lexicographers, as linguists, into a world which is end-to-end -end training, and you say, oh, it's very useful, but how do you combine the two strands? Yeah, no problem. So, <clears throat> in the same sense that people create text that ends up uh, either a strings of text in a dictionary or a strings of text in corpus. So chat GPT or um, <clears throat> any, you know, artificial intelligence system just creates text. And then you do the same thing as a lexicographer with that text, which means that w uh, if, uh, if you would get a definition uh, from the machine, you would do, when you put it in the, in the database, you would do exactly the same thing as if you would get it, or it would be created by a human, which means that it gets structured. Everything that is created by the machine gets structured in exactly the same way as uh, I described. So it's just the source that is not human, but machine. This is related to Tanara's question. Uh, first of all, she says it's brilliant work and thanks for sharing. And uh, the question is about crowdsourcing. What is the criterion you follow to decide what synonyms, antonyms, suggestions get to go to your database? I think it, it could also be widened to suggestions from machines or, or the crowd. Uh, how, how do you decide? Uh, well, the decision is basically lexicographers. So lexicographers decide, but uh, based on the data that we have. So if um, we will basically try to automate anything and everything we can. So if we find a way that these decisions are supported by some kind of mechanism, we will use that, but in the end, it will always be the decision of a human, let's say. <laughs> Which is a good question. If we should basically just ask uh, the artificial intelligence system, and that is the good enough uh, well, decision-making process, we will test that too, but as a next step. 
Good. I, I just asked uh, the organizers to put uh, the link to the Bruno workshop uh, in the chat here. Uh -huh. or, or would you like to comment? No, no. Well, when exactly? If, uh, I don't know the date. 28? 28, uh, I think? I think it's June. Uh, after uh, Janibav, so uh, all Estonians, the week after Janibav, the midsummer uh -huh. festivities, uh, <laughs> the week after, yeah. But, but, we'll, but we'll we will, we will put the link. We'll try to put the link yes. in here, yes. Any more questions? Yes, Heiki. Why are you in is it yeah. Why are why are you insisting on using an European large language model, not an not a American one? Well, we are absolutely interested in using American one, American ones too. In any way we can, but what I think, you know, for the future of all the languages that are in Europe, is that a Europe an open an open European model comparable to the American ones should be created. Just to have it and not be dependent on, uh, I don't know, North American companies. Probably an addition would be that the difference is not really between American and European, but for, for profit and not for profit. Yeah, yeah, also that, yeah. Any more questions? How are we with time? Yeah. Uh, yes, we can ask more. Uh, I would like to ask about the types of lexical units that you have in the database. Uh, collocations, phrasal verbs, uh, and so on. Can you always distinguish between them? C can you decide for, for a particular string of words. Can you decide whether it's a collocation or a construction or a idiom, phrasal verb, whatever? Oh, yeah. Well, this is, I mean, this <laughs> for lexicographers in the room, I think this is the m most interesting part, I guess, because it's, you know, with language, we all know that it's always like you cannot just say straightforward go to the left, go to the right. It's always somewhere in the middle. So what we wanted to do with the system is just to create something that is robust enough that in most cases we know where to put our, so in which type, which type to assign to a lexical unit. And the useful thing is that <coughs> you can have, um, so, you can have something that looks like a collocation, but it's not understandable enough, so it becomes a compound, because you need to explain something about it. So that's the deciding factor. If you have to explain, it's one type. If you don't have to, it's the other type. And this is the principle that goes with all the, all the four. So. <coughs> uh, in most cases, you would know what to do based on semantics. But the semantics is um, subjective, right? Sure. You, you, c you can have inter-annotator disagreement there. Do you have a method for changing your mind? Like, uh, I how easy is it? Are, are they in, in separate uh, database entities? Do you have to move it from one entity to another, or you ch simply change the type? You change the type. Yep. You change the type. Everything mm -hmm. else is the same. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, this is useful in the relational databases. So it's, oh, if you have, um, so when you assign synonymy, everything stays the same. It's just the relation that is created. And this is the same for all changes and types and so on. And this also applies for the lines in your table that you had in different colors, the, the ones that have a meaning attached and the, the ones that don't? Uh no, not really. No. So the, the core part, so all lexical units would actually stay in the core part if we were talking about colors. Mm -hmm. uh, it would change only if some morphological features would change, which would have consequences for the, you know, 
the morphology, pronunciation, and other stuff, which is the other color. So a lexical unit is always a lexical unit. It's just that some of them have meanings attached and yeah. some of them don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? I'll continue then. Um, you said you will have the uh, dictionary writing system ready in October. Mm -hmm. uh, do you plan it to have? Do, do you plan to have it ready, finished, and forgotten, or no. any further development plans after that? Well, that's. Mm. <laughs> I. I can mention that uh, because um, I think that everybody has the same problem. So, all. Uh, computer scientists and all everybody who knows anything about coding suddenly became very expensive, very, very, very expensive. And we are really struggling with that. So we, I think we, I hope that we are kind of lucky that we found a company which is kind of excited about developing this system, and we hope they will stay excited also after October. Otherwise, we'll have a problem. <laughs> Perhaps um, one kind of a radical question, because we see how you can combine it to um, improve and further advance this exciting work. At the same time, it reminds me a bit some years ago when uh, people working on libraries, um, they also had their databases and everyone looked up in the database exactly where to find a book and it was um, a science to put things into the database. And they said something like Google, a search engine, can never replace us because um, it is not precise enough. A librarian wants to find exactly does the book exist and where does it stand. Nowadays, uh, our library just offers a single um, place to type in things like Google. Uh, so do you think that the kind of work we do as scientists leading to this highly structured data will instead, it will indeed be necessary and for which will it be necessary and won't it just be replaced by end-to-end -end trained systems like GPT? Well, uh, <clears throat> I think there are two answers to that. One is we don't know because it's too early to know that. The other thing is that um, <clears throat> what we do know at the moment is we don't have really good descriptions uh <clears throat> of semantics of all the languages of concepts, let's call them concepts, that would be really useful for artificial intelligence because we get that kind of questions from a lot of places. So we need accurate information. This is what they say. We don't need the information we don't know anything about. We need accurate information. And on the global level, such a resource does not exist, <coughs> in my opinion, and we should create it as, I don't know, lexicographers or whoever, <laughs> linguists. Or whoever. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Let's uh, finish this uh, section here because we are running out of time. And uh, we can continue. You will be here two, uh, yeah. two, two, two days. Doesn't. So catch him and uh, we'll get more information out of him. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we thank have. You. Thank you so much. <laughs>